Making history by inspiring the future. Legacy Levers. Visit legacylevers.co.za for more inspirational content. Welcome to the Legacy Leavers podcast. I'm James Preston, and with us today we have Nadav Awesome Driver. Nadav, welcome to the Legacy Leavers podcast. Thank you for wanting to speak to me. Oh man, it's such a privilege to have you in town, let alone actually speak to you with us on the show. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just tell us a little bit what. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you're in Durban. So actually, um, you know, through Later Sidings, the app I invented uh, a few years ago for sharing sidings and wildlife and helping people on their safari. You know, it's working well in a few game reserves in South Africa, and uh, there's one big one that we aren't in yet is Shishlui. And so I basically wanted to come visit Shishlui and, you know, kind of also find out from the researchers, you know, if the app were to work, what would they get out of it? And, uh, and also for them to help start, you know, sharing sightings because they're there all the time. But, yeah, it's kind of to see how the app can grow in the side of South Africa. So, for those of you that don't know yet, Nadav is the founder of South Africa's biggest YouTube channel, which is Later Sightings. Um, Later Sightings shares sightings, uh, started in the Kruger National Park, right? So, it it shares sightings in the Kruger National Park, where they are, and and various details about them. Um, And if I'm not mistaken, it started on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah, so on all social media, uh, social networks, because for me... It was the fastest and cheapest way. I mean, it's free to, to, to basically reach millions, hundreds of millions of people without developing any software or anything like that, yeah. So tell us, take us back to those early days. How did it start? So I've always been going to the Kruger Park since I was eight years old, and uh, I've just been in love with it. You know, I, I saw my first Pride of Lions turning around the corner, and uh, it was just the best feeling ever. And uh, I just I begged my parents to go back every single year. And when I was 15, we went, and, um, you know, it was a quiet trip. We, we stopped and asked cars if they'd seen anything, and, you know, a lot of people were just having really a quiet time. And so I remember thinking, somewhere right now, someone's looking at a line. I mean, this Kruger is huge. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really it's the size of countries in the world. And so, you know, someone had to have been seeing something interesting, and I didn't know where it was. And so that's kind of where I had this idea of, when people share their sightings, it could really help other people in the area. And uh, especially me at the time, I wanted to see more animals. And, uh, and yeah, so I thought there's a community where people could share. That's kind of maybe it would work. And, uh, you know, I didn't really think of it as a, as a huge viral thing or a business or anything. I just thought of it as literally a cool way of seeing more animals. And, um, and yeah, so I was, I was 15. I was on the December holidays. I went and uh, and I googled how to how to build an app or how to you know how to create this community and yeah and that's when I, I kind of also started a Facebook page and Twitter and WhatsApp groups. So um, you were 15 at the time. Yeah. Did you start the app right there and then, or was it just Facebook and Twitter at the beginning? So it was actually it was a bit of both. You know, I didn't have a I had an iPhone and uh, I wanted the app to be on iPhone. Um, but again, it was I phoned I phoned developers, and they said it'd be about two hundred thousand rand to develop this, and I didn't have that. So I started off with Facebook and um, and Twitter and stuff like that. But I also at the same time borrowed a Mac and uh, and went on YouTube and, and Googled and YouTube how to make an app. And, um, and so I did do both. It was uh, you know it was social media that really helped the app. You know, get thirty thousand downloads in the first three weeks of wow. uh, you know putting it on the app store. So, when did you actually launch the the app? Because um, a lot of people know about the Twitter, the YouTube, yeah. even the Facebook, even the WhatsApp. You know, people enter Kruger and they get onto the WhatsApp group. Yeah. Not a lot of people know about the the app the as app much. Itself. So, uh, from the time that you launched the Twitter and Facebook, how long was it until you launched that app? So. It was actually 2012 that the app first came out on uh, on, on iPhone, uh, but it was an app that I had bought in three weeks. And how, how and, old were you at the time? Uh, I was 12. 15. So. Wow. And um, and yeah, and you know, it was and it just came out, and I was really excited about it. But 
when I when I actually looked at it and saw that 30,000 people downloaded it, it was not a professional looking app. And you know, WhatsApp was working, Facebook was working. It was you know, million dollar businesses that have been tested and user tested, and so obviously they were working. And and so when I saw this app, and it wasn't really a perfect app, you know, it wasn't really a user friendly thing. That I didn't actually really promote the app that much, as opposed to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and um, and stuff like that. So that's kind of why I think not a lot of people are using the app as opposed to social media. But in the past two months, we've actually released a, a brand new, professionally built native iOS and iPhone app, uh, iOS and Android app, right. and. Um, and yeah, now with, you know, in the past two months, we Nothing have ten thousand for, for South Africans. Uh, just WhatsApp <laughs> and you. Facebook, and uh, but yeah, I mean, like you know, BlackBerry has been a bit hard, so we kind of just put that for a bit later. Um, but yeah, now in the past two months, we have up to ten thousand members on on the app itself. Wow. So yeah, I mean, compared to Facebook, when we have one hundred sixty-one thousand people, it's still a pretty not known or not used app. Um, but uh, you know, we're tweaking it a lot and still. You know, there's still a lot, way, a long way to go. So, just take us back to that first, um, that first day that you came back from the Kruger and said, "You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for this, right?" Yeah. So, um, you get back from the Kruger. You've got this idea in your head. When did you? How long was it from that day that you got back into your house to registering the Twitter domain and the Facebook page? So it was actually. It was it was interesting. I mean, uh, you know, I, the first trip when I had kind of this idea was uh, was earlier. It was around probably around October, and uh, or or the month before. And was that 2011? Um, yeah, 2011. And um, and then I already, you know, I had I was part of the Sand Parks Forum. You know, way before like 2009. Like I was, right. I've always loved wildlife, and I was yeah. always part of this forum. And so I kind of knew a bit of people there, and um, and when I got back, that's when I thought, you know, let's see, you know, the signatures were saying when they're next in Kruger. So I'd say, oh, I can see you going to Kruger this week. Would you share your sightings? And um, and you know, I had a Facebook page, and it was it was Kruger sightings at the time, and also latest Kruger on Twitter, and. Um, but there wasn't really, we weren't really tweeting anything. And, uh, and I told those people, like, I have this idea, would you, you know, would you maybe join and, and share your sighting? And a lot of people said no. You know, they, like, not like they didn't like the idea. It was just such a new concept. But out of the one, out of the ten or something that I asked, one said yes. And, you know, he shared. And thankfully, he had, like, a brilliant trip. You know, he saw brilliant. a lot. So he saw a hell of a lot of animals. And the rest that said no had a quiet time. And that's when I said, like, I told them, well, if you use, you know, if you kind of followed the Facebook page, you know, you would have seen this, you would have seen this, you would have seen this. And they all, like, went, like, oh, wow, yeah. I mean, we probably would have been able to see it. And, and that's kind of when I saw, like, you know, a lot of people needed this. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me. And, uh, and that's kind of when I did it. You know, it was really soon after. It's so easy to register a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And, but it's more like the running of it uh, that, yeah. that takes up the most. But it was pretty soon. And um, I also had a, a YouTube channel already running, you know, from before that my first video ever got 5 million views. Wow. Um, and, yeah, I mean, also with the YouTube, the part of program was way later. But I always kind of had this vision where, you know, if we have a lot of followers, we can be the place that people send in their videos. Mm. And, um you know, and I always had that vision, and I was so excited that maybe I think it was 2013 or end of 2012 where those people were starting to send in like great footage, and we put it on our YouTube channel, and that's exactly what happened. And until this day, it's exactly what's happening. Wow! And I was really excited to see that. Yeah. Wow! And so you you've obviously worked hard even from day one. Yeah. So you started the Twitter, you started the Facebook, you had your YouTube channel. Um, so you were actually getting onto Sand Park's website, onto the forums, and, and engaging with people. Yeah. So you were actually working hard. This wasn't so just was a, a sit back. I've started. No. You actually it, worked hard to build it it's, up. Right? Um, you know, the one thing that I've seen is really that people appreciate effort, and yeah. um, and I put in a lot of effort. I mean, thirty thousand dollars in the first three weeks. I spoke to a lot of people, and um, and yeah, it was kind of just not only speaking with them. Because I don't like it when I see ads saying download this app or buy this, you know, do this, do that. You know, it's kind of, it's too, we push that all the time. There's ads everywhere, you know. And, um, and so what I thought is if I was able to help someone, 
then if I told him to download the app to get more help, it would be really, you know, much easier. And um, that's what happened on Twitter. Like, we help people see their first pack of wild dogs in their lifetime or their first leopard in 23 years. And the next tweet was, oh, great, if you want to, like, you know, we can help you a lot more, just download the app or join our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter. You know, it was it was so much easier, you know, because they knew, okay, this app can help me see animals and stuff like that. And so it was a lot of effort, but it paid, you know, it, it, it pays itself back so much because all those people that we spoke to are still on the app three, four years later. And so as opposed to an ad where they download it, they have no connection, yep. where this is kind of, it's, it's you know, they, they've kind of no latest sightings as like, a community and a family that's helping them out. And so I think that's that's the biggest, it's the hardest work out of everything, but it's, it's you know, it's what grows the community. So how old are you now, Uh 19 years old. 19 years old. You finished school when? Yeah, I finished school uh, when I was 18. To, uh, like, so it's now so the starting of the second year that, okay. I'm, that I'm out okay. of school. So you finished, so we're in 2016 now, so your, your matric year would have been 2014, 14, yeah. right? And... Have you gone straight into studies, or do you feel like, you know what, I've got so much to do, I actually don't want to rush into studying something yeah, just yet? It's exactly, it's, it's exactly my, my thought process right now. Is I've got latest sightings, and I really want to see how well it grows. I mean, in Kruger, we have 450,000 members on all our social media and our app and stuff like that. And that's just for one park. And there, there are hundreds of other game reserves that are huge, small, you know, that need this. And um, like Shishiri, for example, it's not a big park, but we went there and there's a lot of potential. And so, yeah, I felt like, you know, going to university right now, uh, it's just kind of, kind of break that momentum for me. And so, you know, I'm learning so much with this. You know, I'm learning how to, how to run a community you know, how to build a business. You know, it's not really a huge business yet, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the, the process of learning, you know, what works and what's not. And, and also having reached to, to hundreds of thousands of people that love what I love. And, um, you know, it's fun to, to do that, to be able to do that and share that. Yeah. How do your parents feel? You're in your so, second year, not studying? <laughs> So I'm so lucky because my parents are the most supportive ever. You know, they've never, they've never ever once said, don't do this, it's a waste of time and, and stuff like that. I mean, I've heard a lot where, you know, wildlife, there's nothing really in the future of wildlife or, you know, or like this, there's nothing ever in the future of this, don't do it, go study. And that happens a lot. And, you know, with this, it's kind of was my passion. And, you know, I started it when I was 15 in school. And, you know, we, we kind of saw it grow up, you know, from, from zero to, to a few hundred thousand. And so my parents supported me all the way. They kind of just said, just don't forget about school. You know, obviously you need to pass your matric or you need to pass your exams. But, you know, in terms of not studying and going to university like this year or last year, it was because, because I started earlier that by the time I was in matric, we had like hundreds of thousands of people like every day. That it was, you know, they obviously saw potential, and I think it made that decision a lot easier on them. But, you know, the the support has been huge and um, incredible. Like, awesome. like my dad's probably the number one fan completely. You know, awesome. everywhere we go, it's the best. And so yeah, I'm I'm really I'm I'm honoured, privileged. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship for young people. Um, a lot of people are saying, in terms of an education, especially if you know if you go to America. The, the universities are so expensive. Now, sure, our universities are very expensive by standards, but in terms of uh, how much it costs to get into some of the big universities in the States, it's just, it's some, some people pay off these student loans forever, yeah, right? Forever, yeah. um, do you, as a young person at the age of 19 years old, do you feel like there is a shift for young people in the world today? Growing think... up in a global economy, um, how, how do you feel about where the future of education is going, and specifically tertiary education? So, so my, you know, my view on this is completely, you know, I haven't been to university, but I have these higher people and educated taking me really seriously, and it's amazing to, it's amazing, it's an amazing feeling for me to have that, where, you know, they haven't asked what degree I have and stuff like that, and I think it is it's, it's really still, it's so important to have, you know, to have that education. I'm going to, 
one day, you go to university and stuff like that. But I think as opposed to, you know, I don't know how it was pre-internet, but from what I hear that, in, in, like, back in the day, it was really, it was so much more vital than it is today. You know, right now, you know, in my matric, YouTube was probably my, my, my number one way of learning. And, um, wow. you know, even in class, I didn't take a lot of notes. You know, mm. I, I barely took notes because I know that when I get home, I can watch a 30-minute video, put it two times the speed, and I'll get everything and I'll learn, literally understand every single word because that's how I learn. Like, you know, listening to people, reading books, for me, isn't how I learn. And it's not, you know, it's not like it's the wrong thing. It's just not how I learn the best. And so I think with internet today, if people use it properly and, and if it's their way of learning, it can really change their lives, you know, especially for maths and science. For me, I was, and before I learned about YouTube, I was struggling. But uh, with YouTube, it's literally it changed my life that, uh, you know, I ended up getting distinctions for them and, wow. um, and stuff like that. And the same for university. You know, a lot of my friends who are at university who are my age and are doing our second year rely on YouTube as well. And, and so I think, you know, the access that people have today is so much cheaper or even free most of the time than, than what people had before. And especially, you know, I can go on, I can go on to YouTube now and as if I'm in Harvard, I can go to search Harvard into a lecture and I can literally go to Harvard from being in South Africa. And, and it's not only me, anyone with internet can do that. Obviously, I think people without internet, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a bit of an issue, but anyone with internet that has a, an hour a day or two can literally go to Harvard and, and Princeton and yeah. Yale and all of that. And that's, so I think, I think it is a, a huge, a huge shift. And, um, I think I think you can, you can get far based on internet and learning what you need. You know, even coding, I learned everything that I had. I'm not really a coder anymore because I had to focus on actual school that I was in. But at the time, I was I was developing an iPhone app just on what I learned on YouTube, and um, and I didn't even go through all the tutorials. I just went to what I needed. You know, so I think there is a huge change, and I think people have to have to take advantage of it while it's like this yeah. and while it's free. You know, I think it's a huge change. Now, um, you, you mentioned people respect you even though you don't have a degree. Have you not at least come across a few? Yeah. Especially, uh, you know, in, in my experience, the professors, a lot of the professors and already highly educated people are the ones who would question your credentials and your yeah. qualifications. Have you come across those kind so, of people? Yeah. You know, it's... it's it, you can't please everyone, I found. Uh, but, I mean, just examples of the people who have given me, like, somewhat respect and, you know, just not, like, kind of look down on me for not being to university. So I got to, I got to meet, shake hands with President Obama. Wow. I got to, you know, be the keynote speaker at Facebook and in, wow. a, a Google talk and, and meet the Prince of Harry, uh, uh, you know, from the UK and stuff like that where people are seeing what we're doing and, and really are seeing it for what we're doing and not, you know, oh, he has a, you know, this degree and stuff like that. You know, so those are the types of people that really, I think, see through all of that and see what they're actually doing. You know, if you're actually working hard because a lot of people who go to university and maybe can't get a job or stuff like that. So I think, I think a lot of people see it for what you're actually doing and accomplishing. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are obviously a lot of people who, you know, who, who are maybe grown up to think you have to go to university, otherwise you're a failure, or you have to do this, otherwise you won't get it far in life. And I think, I think it's a conditioning where, you know, we can't really say anything about that. If that's how you believe, then, then it's fine. But um, I think a lot of people who were brought up to think that way are the ones that kind of do question me sometimes and tell me, you, you know, you, you won't get far, you have to go to university. And, uh, and I mean, I'm listening. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like predicating my decision on going to university based on that. But uh, I think it is important. I see the value in it, and that's why I want to do it. But I think a lot of people are conditioned uh, too much to think that you have to go to university to to accomplish in life, and I, or to to be accomplished in life. And I don't think it's the only factor. I think it's the person itself. Do you think you there's a chance that? you'll find yourself at the age of 40, 45, 50 and have never gone to university? Um, I hope not. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, 
how it's going now is, uh, you know, I felt like I really need to be full on in the business and, and in later sightings and in, and in growing the conservation part of it. Um, and I do really want to go to university. I also want to have that experience, you know, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I hope not, uh, you know, and if I do, I, I hope that I've got something to show for it, that I didn't go until I was 50 or 40. But I do, I do see myself going before. Yeah. All right. Now, just to take us back to some of those experiences. You, you know, you've met President Obama. You've spoken at Facebook. You've spoken yeah. at Google. Um, you've met some of the biggest YouTubers in the world. You know, um, in the in, in the years that you've experienced all of this, what are some of the key things that you've learned? Tell us some of the highlights, and what are some of the key uh, points that you've learned from those highlights? So, for me. Um, the biggest thing that I've learned, like overall, out of all these experiences, is is that what you know what I've managed to do through the community. It's not only me, but kind of what my community has managed to do is to really do a lot for wildlife and and really you know create awareness and spread the passion for wildlife. And I think that's what a lot of the a lot of these people are recognizing and are trying you know to thank their signings for what they're doing. Uh, you know, so when I when President Obama came to South Africa, it was a whole, it's a whole town, a town hall meeting with youth of South Africa, you know, to um, to just discuss the future of South Africa with the president, and um, you know, and it's kind of also was the American embassy's way of you know of also like congratulating these people for what they've done, and so so I think. What I learned a lot is all these all these businesses or these higher people are kind of just seeing what we're doing and, and appreciating and saying thank you. And I think that's that's for me has taught me that you know hopefully I can continue to do what we're doing and show that people are recognizing it and, and making a big difference. Um, and yeah, and I, and also the one thing another thing that I have learned, especially you know being now closer to YouTube and Google and Facebook is how a lot of people are scared of these companies. Like, you think of Facebook, it's, it's a scary thought. It's a, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge business, a company. It's a, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a huge corporate. And, um, and you think, like, you know, they, they're rigid. You think, like, they don't listen to people that are yeah. small. You think that they don't, like, they kind of have their formulas and that's it. Yeah. There Where, is that fear. There is certainly there, those there kind is. of fears. And yeah. I mean, it's... I've learned for me is that it's not it's not always like that. I mean, it's it's really not like the one day I'll never forget. I got an email from Google saying like, would you come and you know, would you come to the office on this day? And I had to reply saying, no, I'm already at Facebook that day. And I mean, <laughs> it, it was just such a weird email for me to send. No, so the biggest thing I learned was how these how these people that work for these huge businesses are actually really motivated because they're working for huge businesses. You know. Facebook, whatever Facebook does can literally change the world. Google, what they have done has literally changed the world. And so people get really excited. And so they do they do a lot of work. And when they see something like this, that's really exciting because well, a lot of the things that they've said is that their science is really so different to everything else and it excites them. And I think that's why they, they are taking us seriously because even though it's small, they see potential in it. But also it's different, and the people that work there are really passionate about, about their work, and as opposed to you know, working there just for the sake of working there, not for really loving what they do. So, so that's one thing, that's a few of the things that I've learned with all these experiences. Yeah. I know this is a little bit off topic for, for later sightings and what you run, but I want to go there anyway because you're one of the few people in South Africa who's had such close proximity to the likes of the Mark Zuckerbergs and the, uh, yeah. the Eric Schmitz of the world, etc. Um, do you, how do you feel about the privacy issue going online at the moment? So many bloggers and, uh, and, and activists are very much anti the big man, if you like, the big brother, Googles and Facebooks, etc., who are trawling through all our big data. For a guy who's yeah. in the trenches with this material, with this technology, what are your thoughts, especially for a young guy? So, like from the questions, what you're asking about, like maybe they see your location or their stuff like that, or they see your do they do they with... know too much yeah, about so, us as a yeah. as a society? So I've also I've got a really different view on this. 
I love it. You know, I really think that from my side, getting an ad on Facebook that really targets me and that's exactly what I've been looking for, it's made my life so much easier. And, uh, you know, in that specific case, you know, like if I wanted to find about this and, you know, an ad comes up that's exactly that, I like it. And, um, you know, for me, I really like it. You know, I, I, I guess I have to say I'm part of the instant gratification. I like things that are fast and that I don't really have to work as much on as opposed to back in the day, like, even sending an SMS. People, you know, people think, oh, but WhatsApp knows what you're sending. It's not. It's really... They don't actually sit and read all your SMS. They don't know you. They, it's just they give you a platform on sending a, a message to someone halfway across the world in less than a split second. And so for me, I see it as that where, where it's really made life so much faster and easier. And, you know, like even like my GPS app now, when I wake up, it already has my, my destination, which is work, because it averages out where I go and it knows, okay, this is probably where you work. So that helps me a lot as opposed to having to search for the address all the time. And so I don't see it as, as the GPS knowing where I work and live because no one, you know, it's in their privacy terms and conditions. They don't actually look at where you work. It's a software that knows. And so the only thing about it is if they get hacked, then I guess, you know, that is the bit of the problem. But, you know, generally their security is really good. And, um, and yeah, so I find for me, I really like it. I really enjoy it. You know, because I kind of know that they're not looking at me as a person. It's just the software using what you do as a way of making a life faster. And that's the way I see it. It's probably not the way other people see it. And I can understand, you know, like a, a, my grandmother, she it freaks her out, I guess, you know, where, where it knows even just using the GPS and knows where you are. You know, it's freaky, but I look at it as, as how it's really changed the world. And I love it and I really enjoy it. And now, um, Nadav, South Africa. Uh, you are a young entrepreneur who's on the front lines of South African uh, entrepreneurship and economy. Obviously, tourism yeah. is a big part of South Africa's economy. Um, how, how do you see the future of South Africa? Um, we have so many challenges. There's so much on the go. Not everyone has access to internet. Not everyone has access to a national park. You know, uh, the young people of South Africa, what what advice would you give them? Is there hope? So definitely, you know, I actually recently read a, a statistic um, that South Africa is an average five years behind in terms of technology uh, based on other countries. So, you know, like when 3G came out in America, you know, five years later, 3G came out in South, in South Africa was registered to actually use it on a public scale. So, I mean, on the whole, five years is 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 the gap between the internet. I mean, even uncapped, we now have it. And, you know, so even though it came later, we have it. And, and so all these things that they do eventually come to South Africa, it's obviously a lot slower. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen in the next five years in America where then it comes to South Africa. But I definitely think that there is hope because it, it does come here eventually. I mean, you know, we're all using LTE right now. And, you know, and, and so it's all here. I think it's just, it's more, it's more the people who are in South Africa that I think the mo are the most disadvantaged because a lot of the people here, you know, can't afford it or, you know, can't really have access to what South Africa does have. And, you know, because also right here, right now, it's, it's very expensive. You know, internet is still so expensive compared to other countries. And so I think that's the biggest factor is the fact, is the fact that not everyone can have internet. You know, um, also Mark Zuckerberg was saying once that, you know, I don't really know the exact statistic, but for every one million people who have internet, like it just creates so much jobs, so many jobs and opportunities because people maybe, you know, a few of those people like me who go on YouTube and make their own job or, you know, can actually just find jobs on the internet and stuff like that or, or get an education off the internet to lead them to have a job and, so, and stuff like that. So I think that there definitely is, is hope where maybe in five years' time the uncapped internet or any internet will be as cheap as overseas. And so I think we might have to wait, but I think there's there's definitely hope. And and you know, you're already seeing a lot more a lot more people with smartphones and connected to internet. And it's just they have to know how to use it. It's not only having it, it's they need to know how to use it. Um, but definitely I think South Africa is you know, I think it's one of the best countries. You know, for me it, you know, I like the city and I like the rush. 
but it also has like amazing weather, it has amazing wildlife and resources. It, you know, it's just kind of the technology side that is falling a bit behind. But once we, you know, once we really get that on on track, I think South Africa can be one of the biggest places for startups. Wow! And I hope awesome. I really do. Now um, let's talk about that. You. Uh you stay in Joburg at the moment, right? Yeah. So Kruger National Park is a four-hour drive away? Yeah, four and a half. <laughs> is it? Yeah. How often do you go to Kruger? So I've been really lucky from 8 to 15 years old. I was going once a year. The one time I didn't go for a year and I started crying to ask my parents to go back. How old were you when so- you started crying? Probably I was like 10-ish okay. or something. Okay, okay, no, fair enough. I probably would have done the same at 15. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the Kruger. And uh, and the, the best thing for me is when I'm now working with, you know, with the Kruger topic or wildlife topic is whatever opportunities that come through the app, it leads to wildlife. And so this has been the best thing for me ever where, like, in gray, it, 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 like even in matric, I went, like, nearly every single month to the Kruger. And last year, I went every single month and sometimes four times in one month. Wow. Just because there's so much happening and so many opportunities for me to get to the game reserves. Like, two weeks ago, I was actually doing a film shoot for a TV show that's coming out and they wanted to highlight later sightings and a few of the videos that we've received. And so I went and I stayed at a luxury game reserve in the Kruger. And, and so it's really those opportunities that it was actually work. You know, I had to work, I had to do form, but in a way it wasn't. Like my work was I had to go on a game drive and be a guest. Or I had to, and then I had to speak about videos about wildlife. So for me, it's, it's the best and I absolutely love it. And I'm really excited that I'm able to go and work, but the work is actually what I would do on a holiday kind of thing. But uh, it's amazing. I'm so, so what, lucky. what do you, at the moment, spend most of your time doing? So you're not studying. Yeah. Where does most of your time go to? So I go to the office um, every day. Um, so your office isn't at home? Yeah, no. It, it used to be, but now we have an office uh, where we have, you know, an office manager who helps me organize, uh, you know, my times and stuff like that. And we have a social media person um, who, you know, kind of did what I did when I first started and trolls social media for for, for p- potential users. Did you just say and trolls? So, yeah, you know, like okay. yeah, it's kind in of a positive way. I know, but it's yeah, just yeah. interesting that we're using that in a positive oh, yeah. way. We're trolling the internet for oh, yeah, for material. Like, trolls aren't usually good, but yeah. in this case, it's the best. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not, he'll never actually troll people. Sure, he'll, sure. He's a troller who goes yeah. around looking. Uh, so yeah, he scouts the internet for for people who who would potentially be interested in the app, and so. You know, the past few months or a lot of the recent times have been me kind of teaching him how I used to do it. You know, even though I felt it came so naturally to me, it's, it's actually it's a new way of marketing that a lot of people just don't know. And so, you know, so it's been a lot of time helping him, helping, you know, helping people in the office. There's two now, but, um, you know, it's sometimes three. And so stuff like that. But also then for me, it's mostly now answering a lot of emails, and, uh, and just thinking of ways of making the app better because, you know, I'm not really so much the, the mind on how to make the most money out of it. You know, I'm more the mind on how to grow it and how to get more sightings and help more people. Um, and so we have also a director who, who's in the office to kind of have the business side of it and, you know, making sure everything's, you know, proper. But um, for me, what I'm busy doing is just kind of, you know, looking for ways of growing and, and getting more people to use the app. So how big is the staff of Latest so, Sightings? And the company's time, called Latest Sightings, yeah, is that right? Latest Sightings. Um, yeah, so right now in the office, it's four people every single day that are there. Um, obviously, sometimes I'm not there doing other so stuff. So the four but people includes whole, you? Yeah, okay. so four people full-time in the office. Otherwise, we have developers that work in their offices. Uh, we have a blogger that writes for us every month, a few, a few articles. You know, and, and stuff like that. So, and also, of course, an update and admin type to make sure the sightings are, you know, valid and just proper and keep stuff structured. And so that's also a full-time person for weekend and weekdays. Um, different people, though. But, uh, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of the, the start, you know, part about it. So you got a crew, you said last year you went to Kruger once, uh, once a week almost. Well, what are you doing? Once a month. So, well, you know, but you said that at some points yeah, yeah, you were going four times in a month. Right. Yeah. So, for you, what what does a trip to Kruger look like? 
So for me, it's actually been uh, th- that time I went four times a month was uh, was one or two of them was for work. The rest was I was just extremely lucky to have family coming overseas okay. and taking me with. And uh, and I mean that one trip, you know, we we managed to see like incredible stuff. And I was the guide kind of thing, so I was really happy about that. But but yeah, a trip now it seems to be if it is for work, it's kind of you know stay at a lodge, get to know that lodge, kind of show them the reach of the app and so and what's really exciting for me to see is a lot of the lodges are already using it and you know you know maybe not as a lodge but the people who work in the lodges because they're so close to Kruger yeah. they need it themselves and so we kind of just trying to reach out to them as a lodge to see like we have so many members that you know that in order for them to use the app they obviously need accommodation whether they'll you know whether they find it out through us or through internet or anything like that they need to, they need to go there and so we want to help people choose a lodge based on sightings, you know, so, you know, if you want to see a leopard, we'll tell you to go to this lodge. And, you know, we have the, the facts and the statistics to really, to show that. And so that's kind of a work uh, thing. But so for me, it's to go to the lodge, kind of get to know the people there, try and go on a drive with them. And uh, the rest of the time, me driving around the Kruger looking for animals by myself, yeah. What's your favorite sighting? So I've had quite a few and... Uh, you know, just incredible stuff. But for one, for me, that so, uh, for me that um, that really is uh, is one that I'll never forget. Was um, was we did we actually went there for work, right? We went and to the lodge. And, um, Sorry, and when you say lodges, let me just interject there. When you say lodges, are yeah. you going to lodges outside the park? Yeah. So, like for example, right now on our app, you can register that you're staying at a lodge. So we have a few lodges on board, Protea Hotel, Kruger Gate, Nguenya Lodge, Nostalgia River Bush Lodge, and all of them are like places where people can stay outside the park. Um, that also some of them have a view that into the Kruger and stuff like that. So when you stay in there, you can share a siding, and that siding will automatically go to the sidings board within a lodge. Wow, and so great. not only does it create like a fun competition with a competition b- between like the people staying at the lodge but on the website you can search and see oh wow gee, today if i was staying at this lodge i could have seen five lions and a leopard or stuff like that and, and it really gets people excited and it gets the lodge's name out there you know and stuff like that so that's kind of what i mean by by okay. getting, so we're getting gonna, we're going to come back to your favorite sighting just now so i okay. want to just stay there on the lodges what about the bush camps Obviously, a lot of people that are yeah that are using the 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 Twitter and the Facebook and the WhatsApp seem to be staying in the bush camps. Yeah. Are they on board, or so is that a harder of, job to, to yeah, work on? Well, you know, with the lodges uh, that are outside the Kruger, the internet is there. They have Wi-Fi, oh, that's right, right. and so you know we we kind of don't take care of the Wi-Fi. We we can't just give them the software, and because they have, they even bring their own TV screen and stuff like that. Because we're not really in the building maintenance type of sure. stuff, so we just give them the software. Where in like the camps within the Kruger, you know, it would kind of I think it would be up to us to to give them the, also the infrastructure to make it work. Right. And so we're not ready for that stage yet. You know, we have a lot of people staying outside the park and uh, and stuff like that. So I think um, I'd love to, you know, one day it's the perfect place to have it. But in the meantime, we're kind of focusing on uh, the lodges outside. Okay. Yeah. So back to your favorite sighting. So the favorite Facebook. sighting was, uh, you know, we were saying, we were trying to show people on the lodge this app and we did a drive and uh, we didn't really see much, sadly. So we dropped, we dropped them back off the, at the lodge. Like we didn't see a lot in terms of animals, but they got to know the app, which was really cool. Um, but I'll never forget, there was 30 minutes left or well, there was 45 minutes left of the gate and and I was like, no, nah, I can't take this opportunity. I can't miss this opportunity to take a half an hour drive because that's the best time of the day. And I was there with another person and, you know, they were kind of a bit tired of driving so they didn't want to come with so I went by myself. And, um, and uh, I like to drive the whole day, like 24-7. I don't ever go back to camp. And so people think I'm crazy because in the heat of the day, what are you going to see? You know, nothing moves in the heat of the day. Well, I've seen a lot and so I just take all the chances I can. And um, so I went in, 
and I went to this water hall where on later sightings there had been a leopard and wild dogs there recently, and so I was hoping there would be something. Um, Which water hall was it? Uh, you know, Bartokat, it was on the S65. Okay. Uh, that's the water waterhall. And so I went there, I stayed, nothing really came down, so I was like, oh, whatever. You know, it was, it was a nice drive, didn't really see much, but anyway. And I had my GPS uh, linked to Port Kruger Gate, so it would tell me if I leave, at what time, when I would get there before the gates close. And so it said now I'd get there 10 minutes before the gates close. So I was like, okay, let's start driving. And uh, when I got to the end of that road, I, there was a water hall the day before I had seen a lion there. So I decided it was only 100 meters off. Let me just go there. I went there and I found a lioness playing with her cub right next to the road. And I parked and I was like so excited. I was like, yes, I have something to show for it. You know, there's a, there's a method to my madness of driving around the whole day. And so I was like excited. This would have been a brilliant sighting it was right, right next to the road. And uh, I could only spend like, you know, really five minutes of it. So I looked, I took my video, and I'll just never forget about to do a U-turn. And by then there was another car, you know, who was also a guide who uses the app. He, we were kind of sharing the sighting. And as I was about to do a U-turn, I saw him looking on this side. And uh, I don't think he even saw the lion. On this side, there was a leopard. And um, wow. and kind of where I had parked was blocking the view of the leopard of the lion. And so oh, wait. And I was like, wait, what, what must I look at? I'll never forget, like, like literally, like, looking in the middle because I wasn't sure where to look. But uh, it was incredible when suddenly I, like, I reversed a bit and this gust of wind came from the leopard towards the lion. So the leopard still didn't know, really know about the lion. The lioness and her cub suddenly looked up and... Uh, and started walking towards the leopard, and the leopard ran up up a tree. And it was just the most incredible thing, because like, you know, it was you just never know what to expect. Yeah. And and I was all by myself, so driving back to, and getting to the gate before it closes, I was like shouting to myself like out of excitement. And I t- and then this is why it was probably my best sighting is I told my friends like back home like what I'd seen, and they were like, but aren't you there for work? <laughs> and I was like, this, this, is, this is my work. And I, I realized, like, you know, what I'm doing is really what I absolutely love. And even though this is my work, it's so cool to have, you know, to go to the best place and, you know, to the game reserve and stuff like that. So that's probably for me why it's probably one of my best sightings, just because it, it just meant a lot. And to, to wow. know that what I'm working with is actually something I really love. Yeah. And um, it wasn't, didn't even feel like work. And yeah, but it's just that excitement of spotting a leopard at the line oh, sighting and incredible. the interactions, nothing. Yeah, oh, nothing I, can, like I can relate. I've had many a moment where, uh, in the Kruger where we're looking, at, looking for something and then all of a sudden a lion something comes out else. of here or something. Yeah. It's just, I mean, that's, those moments are what Kruger's all yeah, about. Like you yeah. just, you, your adrenaline is yeah. rushing, like oh, extremely. Can, can totally relate. I mean, I'm going to indulge myself just quickly. I'll tell you how my wife and I got hooked on the Kruger. Yeah. I took her <laughs> to the Kruger for our one-year anniversary. And yeah. we went, I didn't know anything about how to do it. Went to a and b in Palaboa. Okay. And uh, for the South African audience, the, especially the northern South African audience, the Palaborva. And uh, we were staying at a and b outside then. And we were on anniversary, so I was going into the park at 12 o'clock every day. And we weren't seeing much. On yeah. the last day, we decided to go in at 6 a.m. You um, have to. And oh. as we're driving in, literally in just after the gate, my wife shouts, cheetah, 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 on the side of the road. Kind of wow. Exactly. And, uh, rev- and I said to her, no, it's probably a leopard. You reverse back. There's a leopard right oh. next to the car. And we're like oh, 100 so cool. meters, 200 meters away from the Palabor gate. Yeah. It's so rare that a car behind us... Drove past, yeah. and he didn't even stop. Just, he, he kind of glanced and carried on driving. The leopard then proceeds to walk out, rubs himself against our car, and rubs off wow. into the bush. We were freaking out, and that was us done. That yeah. was... We, and from that day forward, we've been going to Kruger every year. Yeah. So, I mean, we, and then since then, you know, yeah, you just yeah. you do what you do. You're in the park all the time, and you see... You just have those sightings that yeah. makes you keep coming just, back. Yeah, like, you know, even if you have one day we see absolutely nothing, like... For me, it's that feeling that you just never know what's around the next corner. And, like, especially that day where I had this lion and leopard, I think the reason why the person I was with didn't come with is because that day we really didn't have a lot of sightings, you know, really quiet. Yeah. But for me, like, it just doesn't doesn't yeah. demotivate me. It just makes you like, oh, what I see yeah. next is going to be even For better. me, I find 
people, when I've had a bad day of sightings, I want to keep going yeah. until I see something. It's when I see a lot that I'm like, actually, I need to go on a yeah, I've seen so much. It's you know? true. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just also like I had a similar thing where um, my mom was overseas doing work and it was just me and my dad at home and we were like, should we go to the Kruger tomorrow? Uh, and like, I never thought my dad was going to say us, but he's like, oh, let's go, why not? And so we went the next morning. We had a brilliant time, but the first, also the first signing of the trip that made me feel like this was meant to be was also like a kilometer from the gate. I looked and it was just leopard, like just sleeping wow. next to the road. And also because we were came from the gate, lots of cars like didn't even stop. And, and, you know, it got up and stood in the road and walked off. And so really you just, you don't expect things like that. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it also ended up seeing a, a kill that turf. That was wow. really cool. Yeah. So, what's your favorite area of the park? Favorite so, part of the park? So, for me, it's 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 definitely down south. My personal favorite is Kukuza because it's really where a lot of the members stay, and it's also closer to Joburg, so I like doing that. And and yeah, the sightings are just incredible there. It's uh, you know, I, I still go ready for sightings, and I love to see animals and and stuff like that. And so, I find I know that area a lot. So. Even sometimes when I don't get a report on later sightings, you know, I can still know where to go and where to look. And, and yeah, I get to see a lot because of that. And, and uh, just in wrapping up, I know you've got a flight to catch. Uh, now, yeah. Dave, what, what's the biggest achievement that you want later sightings to achieve yeah. for the Kruger and for these, these game reserves that you're working so, with? So when I, when I first started later sightings and I was doing school and also doing the trick, it was really hard, you know, to, to do both. And, you know, what the biggest thing that kept me going was, was conservation and the research part of it. Um, I found that, you know, with all this sightings information, like sightings and locations, you know, it was helping researchers in the Kruger and, you know, with their project and really changing the way that they do it. And so that really motivated me to carry on, carry on doing it. And, um, you know, in 2015, the Marshall Eagle Project got 50% of their data from sightings on, wow. on later sightings. And that's huge. I mean, they literally would have had half the amount of information, you know, if it wasn't for, for the community. Awesome. And so I think that that's the biggest thing that really motivated me. And, and not only the research, but actually actively saving animals so because our report is so instant and because we have such a big following in game reserves and people see injured animals whether it's by a snare or by any human or man-made action they report it on their side and it goes immediately to to uh, authorities that can take it up and so a lot of the time you know unfortunately we get reports but fortunately, you know, the rangers can get these reports instantaneously and go out and protect these animals. And um, they've been countless, which is really exciting. Awesome. And, um, and that's how when we expand, this is a big thing that we're focusing on. Also, hence the trip to Shushlui, because we want to see before we start it off, we want to see what they need so we can actually like tailor the app for them. Awesome. And yeah, that's what I'm really excited about. Brilliant. Well, Nadav, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Really appreciate the time. Really love your work. Thank and, you so much. Um, any final words for young South Africans that are watching this? I think the, the one thing that I, that I always try and say is uh, is kind of have to be internally motivated. And, you know, I was never told to do anything. I wanted to do it by myself. Like, even at school, like, I found my parents never told me to study. I wanted to do it. And I feel like a lot of people who are starting stuff, you know, you kind of just see the, the business side of it where not the passion. And, and if they really loved what they were doing, they would do it no matter, like, not no matter what. Obviously, you know, there has to be some boundaries, but they would do it just based on their love for it. And, and I think that's that's the big thing. But the second thing is to actually do it. You know, I've, I've always been kind of uh, obsessive nature where I, if I had something or I thought something was cool, I'd actually learn everything about it and as much as I could about it, you know, and stuff like that. And so I think people, if they have an idea, they they must actually go and execute and learn everything about it and do it. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing. And also to utilize what they have. Internet, the world is your oyster. Like literally, if you have the internet, you have so much so much that you can do with it. Awesome. And so that's the biggest thing. Absolutely. Well, Nadav, thanks again for, for all your work. We Thank wish you, you all the best. 
and uh, we can't wait to uh, be in touch with you on later sightings Thank again. You. Thank you so much. No, thanks, thanks so much. much. Guys, you can check uh, Nadav out uh, on later sightings at later sightings on Twitter, later sightings on, uh, uh, on, on Facebook. Yeah, on Twitter, it's latest Kruger. Sorry, my and, bad, um, latest Kruger, not yeah, latest Instagram, sightings. latest Kruger as well. We have a few others, but if they want to see the biggest one and get linked to the others, they can latest Kruger. Or they can find the me website? on the Dove Austin Driver on Instagram or anything okay. like that. And the website's latestsightings.com. All right. Great stuff. Nadav, thanks Thank again you. and all the best. Thank you so much. Thanks. Until next time, folks, it's James Preston for Legacy Leaders. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Making History. Making History. By inspiring the future. Legacy Levers. Visit legacylevers.co.za for more inspirational content.